Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading will be taken from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. When they, therefore, were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Oh, good morning and happy Sabbath. It's good to be in the house of the Lord once again, and I love coming to, or when the Sabbath comes around, I love when the Sabbath comes around, because it's a, such a blessing to me, and I always look forward to spending time with God, reading His Word, and listening to God, most importantly. I would like to take some time to say thank you to a few individuals. Um, foremost, I would like to thank God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit for allowing me to have this opportunity to share with you all today. I'd also like to thank Pastor Jeff, the leadership team here at this church, and the members of this church for your hospitality and uh, allowing me to come here and speak. I know some of you might not know me, but I will introduce myself here in a moment. Um, I also want to thank my mom who is here with me. She always travels with me. Mom, stand up so everybody can see you. <laughs> She'd rather wave. Uh, but it's good seeing uh, her this morning, and she's my rock. Um, she travels with me everywhere, and I love her so much. And it's good to see my friends here, um, Zoe and Nikhil. It's good to see you all here, and those who are watching as well, it's good to have your presence here with us this morning. Um, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Christian Lawson, and I am 17 years old. I am a rising senior at Atlanta Adventist Academy, and I have been preaching the gospel for going on two years now, and I am glad that the Lord has allowed me to do so. I hope to one day study theology with the hopes of becoming a future pastor or a chaplain. So I am devoted and I am continue to strive towards my dreams. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad in it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. For the Lord, he is good, and he is worthy to be praised. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have of coming together in this place to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I ask that uh, the message today will not be my words or me seen, but you seen, dear Lord. Hide me behind your cross. Lord, I ask that you would be with us and that you would send an extra measure of your Holy Spirit upon this place. Bless this church. Bless the members that are a part of this church and bless everyone here. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to uh, turn back with me to our scripture reading. Acts chapter 1 and verses 6 through 8. And while you are turning to Acts chapter 1 and verses 6 through 8, I just want to give you a little context of what is happening here in the book of Acts chapter 1. Here we see that Jesus is about to ascend into heaven and he has been with the disciples for approximately three and a half years. 
They seen Jesus perform miracles, heal the sick, preach, and so much more. Jesus in Acts chapter 1 is giving them some final instructions that they need to know before he ascends into heaven. Acts chapter 1 and verses 6 through 8, and I will be reading from the NIV this morning, but whatever version you have is fine. It says this, verse 6, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Verse 7, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set in his own authority. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. Here we see in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6 that we see the disciples are asking Jesus, now are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel to the Jews? You would think that after approximately three and a half years of following with Jesus each and every day and being right there with Jesus, that they would understand that Jesus is not in the politics. Jesus is not a politician. But he has come to this earth in order to do the will of his father. See, the disciples had a deeply held religious belief. In other words, they were taught by the Jews that Jesus would save them, the Jews, from the Roman oppression which was put upon Israel. Jesus went against all the beliefs that they had set up, starting with his birth to his death and his resurrection. This morning, church, I want to share with you all a video that um, I saw a few years ago. And when I was watching it just recently, it was very, very encouraging to me. Um, just a FYI, the video does mention some uh, or share some worldly views. It, it uses the word Sunday, um, but the message is still the same for us at Venice. And I believe that... Um, this is something that we need to think about as a church. So please enjoy. I was once told a story by a close friend of mine who said that after a long night of drinking on a Saturday night, he woke up Sunday morning and decided for the first time in his life he wanted to go to church. So he got in his car. He drove, found the closest church he could, and walked into the back door of the service and sat down in the church pew. He said he didn't know what to expect that day, but he felt like he would at least leave there feeling like a better person, feeling a little bit of joy, feeling a little bit of love. Instead, he left there downtrodden. Instead, he left there crushed because of the judgmental looks and attitudes that came his way that day. He said, you know what, man? I think they smelled the alcohol on me. I don't think they like that. He told me that no matter what happens to him in this life, no matter where he goes or what he does, he will never go and sit on a church pew again. Because you know what? He felt more loved, he felt more accepted, and he felt more joy on a bar stool than he did in a church pew. You see, a lot of people who sit in these church pews haven't taken the time to open up the Bible that they beat over top of other people's heads. Because if they did open up that Bible, they would see a Jesus Christ that lived completely different than they do now. They would see a Jesus Christ who came into this world and hung out with drunkards, who hung out with prostitutes, who hung out with tax collectors. They would see a Jesus Christ who said, I come not to save the self-righteous, those who think they have it figured out, those religious people who sit on their high horse and act like they are better than everyone else. No, I came to save those who are in need of a physician. I came to save sinners because I love sinners. We are supposed to mirror Jesus Christ as followers of him. And in doing so, we are supposed to show love to the rest of the world. Jesus Christ said, they will know you by your love. 
He didn't say they'll know you by your judgmental looks, by your judgmental attitudes, by this thought process that you are enlightened and they aren't. They will not know you by your hatred. They will not know you by your condescending looks towards them or the Bible beating over their heads. He never said any of that stuff. He said they will know you by your love. Where's the love? You see, our generation can be different. Our generation can set a new standard. Our generation can say that whether we sit in a church pew or whether we sit on a bar stool, we're going to treat each other with love and respect. We don't have to make the same mistakes that those people who came before us made. No, we do not. We can show each other love. Because at the end of the day, we are all in need of love. The love of Jesus Christ came here and died for sinners. You know where the sinners are at? The sinners are on the bar stool. The sinners are on the church pew. We are all sinners. And we are all in need of the love of Jesus Christ. There has to come a time where we stop seeing each other by the places that we sit and we start seeing each other for the people we are. Because after all, we're just people, people in need of love. What a, what a powerful, powerful message that is to know that, you know, we all need to love each other and we are called to love each other. I had the same exact viewpoint as the members who would sit in the pews um, until one day Jesus convicted me that my viewpoint was wrong. Instead of being judgmental on that individual, I should be loving and caring for them, condemning them of their sins and faults is making me sin as well. As many of you might be wondering, well, why are we talking about the disciples and how does this deal with what the disciples dealt with? See, the disciples had a hard time dropping their prior lives to follow the teachings that the teachings that would glorify the Jews. The perspective that they had was the same thing that many of us have today. We would rather create a belief, a belief like almost the, like the video that we just watched, the church bar stool that was just shared with us. But church, we must look at our problems and situations in life illogically. Because Jesus always looks at our situations, our problems, in a logical way. The reason why I think we tend to look at our uh, situations and our problems as a logical perspective, because we would rather Jesus be glorify or glorify our views of thinking rather than glorify his way. My deeply held beliefs have caused me to really miss the bigger picture as to what God is trying to show me in my life as I walk with him each and every single day. I get so caught up in uh, the legalistic views to the point where I forget God's way. God's way is always the best way. No matter how many times I run from it, I find myself running back to God. Sometimes our deeply held beliefs are based on a learned experience basis. Nearsighted points of view and lack of understanding, pure ignorance. But our perspectives can change when we see things God's way. Here in Acts chapter 1 and verse 7, we see here that Jesus is telling his disciples that uh, God does not fit in your box. The belief that you have about me or Jesus is wrong. 
Jesus tells them that you have no authority or power over God. So this morning, I uh, brought a little gift with me. I brought a Jesus box with me. So um, I have in here a nice little, well, I used to have in here a nice little NIV thin Bible that was given to me as a gift. But I have some words here this morning. And every time I uh, ask Jesus to come into my life, I think that I try to limit him to this little box that I have here this morning. I pull out these words, merciful, perfect, devoted, forgiving, patient, loving, long-suffering, forgiving, and caring. And I say, Jesus, come on, you can work on in my life, you can uh, change some things in my life, but I limit him to these words that I have just shared with you. And when Jesus comes a little bit closer, I say, oh, Jesus, no, we got to put you back in your box. we got to put you back in your box because that's too personal. But see, as a Christian, I have find myself in a point where I limit Jesus to a box. But I realize that, you know, when I limit Jesus, I limit his full capabilities to work in my life. We cannot fit Jesus into a human-sized box that we make for him. His will is always greater than ours. And when they crash, we must adjust away our thinking because perspectives can change when we see things God's way. When we look at the context of verse 8 of Acts chapter 1, we see here that Jesus is telling the disciples a two-folded message. He's saying that the Holy Spirit will come and that you will have new experiences. He tells the disciples that they will receive power But Jesus will give them this power to fulfill his will. The command and the prophecy that he gives to them is that they will travel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to all the world, having experiences, sharing the gospel with others, not being afraid of officials who might try to persecute them or do wrong against them. not being afraid of sharing the gospel. You know, I'm thankful for freedom of sharing the gospel this morning. I'm thankful for freedom of allowing me to be able to worship and share what I believe and my beliefs with other people. It also required them, the disciples, to get out of their own own world views, beliefs, and boxes, and more, to focus on the bigger picture in which that was to be witnesses for Jesus. You know, I like Extreme Weight Loss, the show, Extreme Weight Loss. I love that show. I love how, you know, people come in to uh, receive training from a trainer and they go through this whole process of um, becoming more active and uh, have better eating and also lose weight. So I love just watching that and seeing the before and after pictures at the end of the final episode or the finale. And I consider my Christian experience to be almost like that of being on an extreme weight loss show because Jesus is my trainer and he's been training me for about 17 years now and it seems like I just can't understand. I have been learning that, you know, transformation can only take place when I submit to Jesus. Transformation in our lives can only take place when we submit to Jesus. Through this, I am able to gain a lot of experience 
and gain a new perspective in seeing things God's way. True, true transformation once occurs when we allow the Holy Spirit to empower us and lead us into new experiences that stretch our understanding of the world around us. Our eyes are open under his guidance. Perspectives can change when we see things God's way. This morning, church, I'm making a call. A call for our perspectives to change so we can see things God's way. Once we understand that our deeply held beliefs are lack of understanding, that we can not fit Jesus or God into a human-sized box, and that transformation only occurs when the Holy Spirit empower, empowers us and lead us into new experiences, that when things can change, the disciples had to change. When I read in my Bible about the disciples in Acts chapter 1, I see two totally different pictures when I turn over and flip in Acts chapter 2. Because instead of hiding, instead of being in their shells, they're going out and they're preaching the gospel. They're on fire for Christ. Today, I don't want to, I don't want to be in my own perspective. I don't want to look at things from my own point of view, but I want to look at it from God's perspective. You know, every time I find myself looking at things in my own perspective, I find myself running back to God. Because God way is always right. So if you are accepting the call this morning for seeing things God's way, I want you to just stand to your feet all over this place. If you just want to see what God, the plans that he has for you, if you just want to accept his perspective and not be dependent upon your own perspective, just stand to your feet this morning. And those that are watching here today, the Holy Spirit knows the decision that you have made as well. I want to make a second appeal. This second appeal takes you further. It's more personal. This second appeal is to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I promise you, I promise you without a shadow of a doubt that God can change things in your life. God can make a way out of no way. The Bible says if God is for me, who can be against me? No power on earth can stop me. I ask today that you see Pastor Jeff or an elder here at Auburn SDA Church. If you want to make that decision, if you want to make that life-changing experience, please see one of them today. Let's pray. Kind Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for understanding that perspectives can change when we see things your way. Lord, I ask that you be with each individual under the sound of my voice. Whether they're in this place or watching via the Internet, Lord, I ask that you be with them as they walk day after day with you. Lord, allow them to have that transformation which allows them to change from one individual to another individual. We see that the disciples, they, they had that change in Acts chapter 1. And in Acts chapter 2, they were on fire for you. They were preaching the word, not afraid and hiding. Lord, I ask that you would give us the ability, the power to not limit you to a human-sized box, dear Lord, but allow you to work fully and completely in our lives 
because perspectives can change when we see things God's way. Ever keep us in your presence, dear Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name I do pray. Let the church say amen. Amen. We all stand for the closing hymn, hymn number 306. Draw me nearer. Kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for the amazing worship experience that we have had. Lord, I ask that you would help us to be transformed and that our perspectives can change when we see things your way. Lord, I ask that you be with us throughout the rest of the Sabbath day and that you would send an extra measure of your Holy Spirit upon this place. Be with these individuals who are here. Lord, bless them throughout the rest of their week and help them to have a very good and prosperous week. In Jesus' name, I ask all of these blessings. Amen.